Welcome to a Prevent Connect podcast, where we explore the prevention of violence against women. This is a project of the California Coalition Against Sexual Assault. Terrific. Hi, can you hear me? Fantastic. I kind of hate that I'm chained to the microphone, but I but it's a large group, and I want I want to be sure that you can hear me. So I'm gonna I'm gonna stay here, not because I'm uncool, but because I'm. <laughs> because I'm sensitive to your needs. Um, I'm Colleen Yackel, and I coordinate the Delta Focus Project for the Indiana Coalition Against Domestic Violence. And I am very, very thrilled and delighted to be with you here today to talk about our prevention resource, the Prevention Toy Box. And I'm sorry to tell you it's in fact a binder. <laughs> not, it's not actually made by Hasbro. But uh, <laughs> this is our prevention resource that um, we're just really excited to, to tell you about. And um, my hope for today is to talk through the six games and activities that are in the toy box and, time permitting, um, I'm hoping we can play a couple of those. That's the master plan, okay? So I wanted just to start for a moment by talking about the why of this thing, why we felt the need to create this resource. And I don't know about all of y'all, but um, when prevention started moving from kind of individual level strategies, individual level education, to focus on the community level, kind of the higher level of the social ecology, we in Indiana thought that was pretty cool, but we didn't know how to do it. We didn't know how to do that. Um, so, you know, as we explored this space and thought about it, we um, found that it was really helpful for us if we created concrete activities to help translate kind of some of that theoretical public health stuff. So it, it just felt like it really worked for us. But also in the context of our work, it felt really, really important as we pivoted to thinking about strategy at the higher levels of the social ecology, that we did that in a way that was supportive um, and responsive to the history that we've all spent kind of doing individual level stuff. So we wanted to introduce these new strategies in a way that felt like an invitation, not like a criticism of the work that we've done before, like we all were invested there. Here's what we learned, thanks y'all. Here's what we're thinking now. So we wanted to construct this in a way that felt clear, concrete, and engaging, really to create an invitation as we worked with local communities to think about how do we do this? We're invested in doing this, we're committed to doing this, walk us through it. So this is our version of the walkthrough. So just a quick overview of our prevention approach in Indiana. So like many of you, really trying to focus our efforts in changing communities, thinking at the higher levels of the social ecology. And in our work, we're just trying to make safe, respectful, supported behavior the easy and expected choice. And we use strategies that are focusing on things like addressing pa practices, policies, and norms in order to make respectful behavior the easy and expected choice. So if we think about the progression in our work, I would say, you know, five, six, seven, eight years ago, our work was really centered on the vase, right? Thinking about the individual, thinking about information, skills that the individual needed in order to be safe. And now we've really transitioned our work to think about the faces, thinking about the context, thinking about how what goes on around us in our communities and our organizations and our families influences and shapes our behavior. So what do we got on that? And because we're greedy about the things that matter, we believe that where we are successful in creating communities that are safe, supported, accountable, nurturing, will be successful in deterring and preventing multiple forms of violence. Right, because they just don't work in that type of community. We're gonna say, we love you, we care about you, here's how we do things here, and when you get it wrong, we're gonna, we're gonna nudge you right back to getting it right. So with that, um, really important to point out the target audience for this resource is people like us. People like us and our community allies and stakeholders are the people that we wanna engage with the toy box. It's not um, a set of activities to um, do with people that we think are vulnerable to violence. It's not a strategy for educating people that we think are vulnerable. It's a strategy for helping people like us and our community allies 
practice skills of primary prevention at the community level. Cool? So let's dig in. This is the first game. It's called Speedy Town. And Speedy Town is a game that really invites people to think about what strategy can look like at the higher levels of the social ecology and to kind of think through the limitation of individual level strategies alone. And it feels super important to me to start there. That's why Speedy Town is the first game in the toy box. Because if we don't start there with our community stakeholders, it's really easy to be stuck there. <laughs> because culture pushes all of us every day to think about individual level responsibility, right? So if we don't start there and ask people to explore the limitations of individual level strategies, that's gonna kind of be their default answer especially if they don't share our brain and work in this context. Um, that's where people initially think about prevention strategy, is telling vulnerable people what they need to do in order to be safe. So we gotta start by talking them out of that. And Speedy Town will help you do that. Uh, the next game is called Let's Go to the Beach. And Let's Go to the Beach is a game that we developed as part of our process to get a lot more strategic and disciplined in our um, prevention work. Um, like I said early on, we were excited about higher level strategies, but we weren't sure how to do them. So whenever any one of you all presented something on uh, Prevent Connect or Cal Casa about your great work, we would think, let's do that. Let's try that here. Um, so we would hear about a new idea and we would try to run with it without first asking, does that fit the need here in Indiana or in this community? Does that make sense here? So let's go to the beach encourages players to think first about their desired outcome, their beach, if you will. <laughs> so identify what you want to accomplish and then work backwards to decide what program effectively gets you there. So identify your outcome and then it also encourages you to make sure that you're on a page with your other allies and stakeholders about that outcome. Has anyone ever been in a room where you kind of assumed that you all had the same goal and it turns out things were very, very, very different? <laughs> very different. Yeah, okay, I won't. I could, but I won't. <laughs> okay, nutty spaghetti I could tell you about, but I want to invite us to play. Um, and this room is not entirely conducive to the activities, but we are violence prevention people. We've seen harder times than this, and we are just, we're gonna, we're gonna push through. So what I need at the back of the room, there's a nutty spaghetti activity, and in the front here there are two. I need nine volunteers to staff each of these, so nine times three. 27 of you, please. I want to invite you to stand and staff one of these Netty locations. And those of you who are not playing, you're going to observe and, and share feedback about the process for us. So everyone has an active role. So we know about these connections between social problems um, through our experience as practitioners, right? We see it every day, but we also know it increasingly through the research. Um, one of my favorite prevention documents, it's getting to be a little bit older now, but the Connecting the Dots document from CDC and Prevention Institute 2014, incredibly helpful starting point um, to think about what are the connections between my work in violence prevention and other colleagues and allies in our community, and what might we work on together to our mutual benefit. So the next game that I want to tell you about is called Fun for All. And Fun for All is about building safe, supported, accessible, inclusive environments for all members of our communities. Um, if you think about your experience, there are probably places that you regularly, regularly go where you can really be your full self. You can let it all hang out, whatever it is. And places where you have to control your identities. Like where you have to modify your behavior in order to safely navigate those spaces. And what happens when you're going to those places where you have to change yourself? What do you do? You shut down. You shut down. You're not really genuinely participating. You're not bringing all of the you. Yeah. You gotta self-censor. You gotta be careful. Yeah. Yeah. 
can't see them. I love that story, and I wish I had a mechanism like that. I'm going to try to come up with one. <laughs> but overall, you're saying that you have strategies that you use to be different than how you are, to safely navigate. I think that's step one. What might step two be? Yeah, yeah, what? Yeah, conform, physical appearance, I think all of that. And I think also, unless you're required to be there, you're probably going to stop going, <laughs> right? Right, like first I'm going to try to safely navigate, but if I don't have to be here, I'm out. I'm out. So that means that community space you don't get to benefit from, but it also doesn't get to benefit from you. It's bad for us. It's bad for our communities, I think where we create spaces that don't work for all of us, we lose all of our genius participation in those places. So Fun For All invites you to think about some really common places in community where people go, hang out, and it also encourages you to think about some characters and their identities, their various identities, and then to design those spaces in a way that really works for all of those characters. So you may be playing uh, a local community grocery store and you're playing as a mama with twin toddlers. Good luck to you. You may be, <laughs> you may be playing as, um, as an older woman who's managing diabetes. You may be playing as a trans girl um, at a high school basketball game. So community places and a list of characters and you just really think, what could I do here structurally? Does anything need to change physically? What needs to change in terms of rules, policies, guidelines? What are the norms? How can we make this place a place that genuinely feels open, welcoming, and participatory for all of us? That's fun for all. Um, so really seeking to foster social inclusion and to reduce exclusion. Because like we said, when the places that we go are not welcoming, do not recognize us, do not support us, we stop going there which results in social exclusion. And why is that important to us in violence prevention? There's protection and connection. There's protection and connection from perpetration and victimization. There's protection and connection. So I think it's in our interest to support our broad participation in genius, but also to deter violence, to ensure that our spaces are welcoming um, and work for all of our community members. The next game I wanna tell you about is called Thriving Tomatoes. And this game is all about developing our skills and our knowledge around evaluation. It's not everyone's favorite animal. <laughs> I love it a lot. Um, I've grown to love it, um, but started really not uh, feeling very confident about those skills. So Fun For All, um, again, starts with regular life scenarios and walks people through some key evaluation concepts, right? Like activities, indicators, outcomes, and asks you to think through something very approachable, easy, and fun. Like, what are the indicators of I've made delicious cookies? <laughs> you know, so you think about things like the number of people who say yum. That that would be an indicator. So fun, straightforward, easy games that help operationalize and practice some, um, some evaluation concepts. And there's one more activity in the toy box I don't have visuals for because um, we just added it. And it's an activity that um, really centers on defining supported community and childhood conditions um, because we know safe, stable, nurturing relationships and environments are preventive of multiple forms of violence. So this activity invites community stakeholders to brainstorm, to think personally and professionally what those constructs mean to them, look like, feel like. Um, so it's a strategy really for relationship building among the people that you might work with in community, um, but also a starting point to think about what might we work on together? You know, what does, it, what does a safe community mean? What does a stable community mean? and really to start to identify what can we do together to increase stability in our community. 
Any questions about any of those six activities? Yes, ma'am, in the back. Uh, the last one is called What Surrounds Us Shapes Us. Okay, so that's the overview of the activities, and if there are no further questions, we'll go ahead and play Speedy Town together. Excited to tell you about Speedy Town. Where I'm feeling challenged is when I play this in an environment I have more control over, I have people seated at tables so that you can work together as, uh, as planning groups. Um, usually I have paper on the tables and markers so that you can draw and brainstorm. Um, we don't have that availability here. So when we start to work together in Speedy Town, I'm just, we're violence prevention advocates, we can figure this out. I'm gonna invite you to just kind of clump together because you're gonna work as city planners to think about and develop a plan for making Speedy Town a safer place, okay? So just kind of try to clump up. We'll clump. Uh, it doesn't have to happen yet, we'll get there, but I just wanted to, <laughs> I'm preparing you for the clumping. Okay, so that's what's gonna happen. I'm gonna invite you to work together and then also to report out to the broader group. So you're, really, you're gonna have to do this. I don't want talking about where we're gonna go for lunch. I want <laughs> Speedy Town focus. Okay, so let's talk about Speedy Town. As you might have guessed, Speedy Town is a place where people drive really, really fast. Resulting in a fair amount of chaos. Lots of accidents and injury in Speedy Town. You're gonna see a lot of lawless behavior behind the wheel. <laughs> so we got a problem in Speedy Town, right? So a lot of very, very dangerous driving behavior going on, okay? So this is where you're gonna clump. So I want you all to be city planners in Speedy Town and I want you to start by kind of discussing this question among yourselves, what is up? What is going on in Speedy Town? What are the conditions in this community that are resulting in such bad driving behavior? Right? So kind of start by defining the problem. And then when you've got that all figured out, I want you to recommend changes to make Speedy Town a safer place for drivers and pedestrians. So you are city planners. Think broadly about all the influences on drivers' behavior and develop a plan to make Speedy Town a safer, safer place. I'm gonna be generous with you, I'm not even gonna give you a budget. So go big, go hard, and um, I'm gonna give you about 15 minutes to do that, and then I'm gonna invite you to report out your plans for a safer Speedy Town. Any questions for that before you begin clumping? Okay, so thank you for thinking about Speedy Town. You had genius ideas, and I know we didn't get to all of them, but here are a few other ideas I want you to consider. So I'm gonna give you an idea, and you tell me good idea, not so good idea, why? What about telling walkers, it's dangerous out there? You don't like this idea. Why? So this, um, we think, is not such a good idea because it puts the burden of responsibility for safety on those who are vulnerable to the accident. Yeah. Okay. What about this? Better you just stay home. Yeah, good idea. No. Yeah. Why is this not so good? Taking away their freedom. It's not feasible. This isn't advice anyone can take. We got to go to our jobs and our stores and our children's places of whatnot. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. yeah. This strategy puts the, the burden on those who are vulnerable and really enables, <laughs> enables, <laughs> They, they agree. Enables the problem to, to get worse. Thank you for that. Maybe. <laughs> what about? They, they could be neon.
yes, ma'am. Doesn't address the problem. Doesn't address the problem, right? So I may head out the door wrapped in bubble wrap. I do a really thorough job. I still get hit by a car. I still have that, uh, maybe I live, but I still have that traumatic experience. I still have the injury. I still, I still suffer that experience. And none of that changes the behavior of drivers. Little frogger. My challenge with these strategies is, as you've observed, they're kind of centered in victim blaming. They try to change behavior of vulnerable people, not the problem, not the drivers. They also kind of respond as if the problem is inevitable, right? Like we're not going to take on the bold agenda of changing the problem. We're just going to try to help you navigate it. We're going to help you suit up or stay home or build more hospitals to serve you after injury. None of this is really, really changing the problem. Do we kind of agree about that? Let's bring it home. <laughs> yes. Right, so, okay, you all, you all get it, you all get it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, two things, one, I'm going to get right to you because you're so polite, and um, I think we get a lot of this, but the people, the stakeholders we work with in community, they're starting here. We've got to acknowledge it. You've got to rip off that Band-Aid and help them see, and Speedy Town, by making it not about sexual violence, allows them to see, and then you can connect those dots, because then you see the absurdity of m so many of the things that we say. Um, so, yes, you get it, and yes. So risk reduction may or may not keep me safe, but it, since it didn't address the perpetration, that injury might be relocated to you. And like you said, to the person who's less protected. That feels really crappy to me. I don't like that. Uh -oh. Sorry. Okay, so just to summarize those ideas for the people that you're working with, just to clarify the role of these strategies that historically we have all engaged in, awareness, are strategies that tell people about the problem, right? Telling about the prevalence or the impact of the problem. In Speedy Town, we were saying the number of people who were injured and the impacts of those injury. Um, risk reduction strategies, like you know, they seek to help people navigate the risks in their lives. And again, that might be effective, may or may not be effective in keeping an individual safe, but since it doesn't address perpetration, that event might be relocated to someone else. Prevention, on the other hand, seeks to change the stuff. So changing the stuff, be it the community stuff, um, individual stuff, but changing things to prevent the violence from happening. So not telling people about it, not helping them navigate it, but changing it. Rather than warning people about risks, working to prevent and eliminate those risks. Um, so helping people see those distinctions because awareness and risk reduction in my opinion, are easy. They are easy. They are well practiced. We know how to do it. And we do it in violence prevention, but we do it everywhere, right? Like think about a public health problem when we start with uh, awareness and risk reduction. But I think as long as we allow ourselves to start there, we will never persuade our communities to invest in the harder work 
of taking on power, gender, discrimination, race, all of the deeper cultural things that are allowing violence. So I feel like we need to be very, very intentional about how we use these strategies and the effects of them. Testify. Okay, so a lot of you talked about this strategy, some kind of drivers that experience, and, and most people do when we, when we play Speedy Town. Um, so I just want us to think about that as a strategy and how that operates. If we think about Speedy Town, Historically in our work at the individual level, we focused on changing knowledge and attitudes among individuals with the idea that that would change their behavior, right? But if we think about what goes on around us, shapes us, and is one of the strongest influencers on our behavior, thinking about I can train you with all the information you know, everything you need to know about respectful relationship behavior. But then if I release you into a community where violence is prevalent, normalized, valorized, tolerated. Maybe there's not a lot of accountability. Maybe you hang out with peers who are you know, engaged in, in some naughty behavior. Maybe if you're disconnected, you're socially excluded, caring people are, are feeling distant. Where you're witnessing violence in community or at home where social norms of privacy keep any of us from talking about any of this, and where strict gender roles that are policed and reinforced in our lives every day from preconception, how likely is it that your behavior is going to change based on the knowledge and attitudes that you've been provided? Hmm? Unfortunately, what we know is not a strong predictor of what we do. So I submit to you that just focusing on the individual level, knowledge and attitudes is an important part of a comprehensive prevention strategy, but alone I suggest to you, that dog doesn't hunt. <laughs> I don't think it'll work. So in our work, we're really trying to move from insulating individuals to help them navigate risks, moving from that approach to really focusing on eliminating those risks. Is it, yeah, it's a heartwarming mouse moment, <laughs> which is kind of rare. <laughs> so thinking about, thinking about and working on the environments in which we're living our lives and how we make those conducive and supportive to respectful behavior rather than telling people how we think they ought to behave when that behavior just isn't available, feasible, supported, et cetera. So as we choose strategy um, in Indiana, this is a framework that we use to think about what we're going to do. We ask ourselves these four questions when we think about prevention strategy. The first one is, will it work? <laughs> will it work and why do we think so? Do we think it'll work because of our own experience, because of community knowledge it feels like a good fit, from the research literature? Why do we think that'll work here? And like I said, that seems kind of duh, but we didn't always ask that, you know? If we just heard about a great strategy, we'd be like, let's do it. So really slowing down to think, will that work here and why? The second question we ask ourselves is, is this fair? Is this ethical? Does this put the burden of responsibility for change on the shoulders of the people who have the power to create that change? Does this focus on removing risks rather than helping vulnerable people navigate them? Let's make it fair because I dislike strategies that um, reinforce the burden on people who are vulnerable. I'm not into that. Um, the third question we ask, because we're greedy about the things that matter, is, is it efficient? So as violence prevention advocates, we all have endless, endless passion, but we have limited juice, right? We got limited work hours and resources. So I try, I try really hard to choose strategies that can affect broad populations or multiple social problems. That's why I try to really center my work in addressing risk and protective factors and working on ones that are going to affect not just intimate partner violence and sexual violence, but child abuse and bullying and suicide. Um, so really choosing strategies that are going to be good things broadly for the community I think is great. And the last question that we ask is, is it equitable? Will this strategy increase disparities between people who are protected and people who aren't? If it does, we kick it out. 
we want to really center our work in um, supporting communities that have not been supported, invested, protected. So we're centering our work there. Because we found inadvertently as a state coalition working primarily with mainstream organizations that we can introduce prevention strategies and those benefits accrue to people who are already pretty protected. Yep. So now we're being super intentional about seeing that and we've kicked out about three ideas because we're like this is just going to increase disparities. We're into adding protections for everyone but if they are not reaching the people with the greatest need then that's not okay. All right, so I want you to think again about all of the ideas that you had for Speedy Town, and I want to invite you to nominate if you only got to choose one, which is unfair because we know multiple strategies are our best um, approach to prevention, but I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna be holding you to a tight budget. So if you could only choose one strategy, which one do you think would have the greatest impact on driving behavior in Speedy Town? Thank you for that. I want to encourage you, thanks, Julie. Um, I want to encourage you to just keep test driving your ideas ar around Speedy Town. Just put the keys in the car, fuel it up, drive out the door, and think about how effective will this intervention be in changing my driving behavior. Um, I'm a big fan of infrastructure, speed bumps. It doesn't matter what I think or know or believe. I'm going to slow down with your rumble strip. I'm going to slow. I'm going to slow down if the roads kind of require that. If there are turns, if there are stop signs. Um, so I dig that. But I think our task then is applying this kind of thinking strategically to our work. How do we speedy town sexual violence? And have these conversations where you can with your colleagues, with your stakeholders, with your young people. They have genius ideas. When we invite ourselves to think differently, if we invite ourselves to think sort of beyond the known strategies around awareness, risk reduction, and education, when we put our genius to a task, you are gonna hear some really exciting answers that in that same kind of way are addressing the infrastructure of social problems through multiple risk and protective factors. You'll come up with great ideas. So thinking about what do we want? What, what do we want for relationships for young people in our community? What do we want for all of our relationships? How do we get there? What's in the way and how do we get there? To really bring it home and apply it to our work. But again, using the speedy town metaphor to make it easy to think that way. Because if we just start by being critical of some of our historical approaches, um, we just, it's not very successful in encouraging people to think differently if we're just critical of, of what we've done before. Any questions about that? So that is the toy box. I am Colleen. If you would like to get one of these items, you can write down my email or I have cards up front and in the back. Just send me an email and I can put one of those, put, put one of these wonkers in the mail to you. Someone can take this one if you have room in your luggage. <laughs> you got it. So just send me a line. There's no charge for the resource or shipping because it's uh, supported by CDC through Delta Focus. Um, yeah, free to you. Th however, how would this proviso, and you all have to quickly cross your cards. Um, in three months after I send this out to you, I'm going to send you um, a request for evaluation, which is just five multiple choice questions like, did you use it? Did you like it? Did it make you smart? Um, <laughs> so, so if you want a toy box, you just got to promise to play evaluation games with me. Thank you for listening to this Prevent Connect podcast. Prevent Connect is a project of the California Coalition Against Sexual Assault with funding from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The views presented on Prevent Connect are not necessarily the views of the United States government, the CDC, or CalCASA. To learn more about Prevent Connect, visit www.preventconnect.org. For more information about CalCASA's mission or to show your support, visit calcasa.org. That's C-A-L-C-A-S-A -A -A dot O-R-G.